So welcome everyone here today and we're delighted to have an amazing set of panelists for our discussion and our exploration of open source program offices in EU government. Though I think we'll be hearing a few stories that go a little bit beyond the EU in this panel session, which is fantastic to hear. Um, so I'm delighted to welcome you all here today. I would like to start by asking each one of our pan panel members to introduce themselves. Uh, Jacob, perhaps you might like to start. Hi there, I'm Jacob Green. I'm calling in from Baltimore today. I'm the founder of Moss Labs, and I'd like to take this opportunity to most definitely thank the Linux Foundation for giving us all the opportunity to present the work and the collaborations that have happened so far. Thank you, Jacob. Saeed, you are also coming from across the Atlantic. Perhaps you'd like to introduce yourself. Hello, uh, I'm Saeed Chodhi, the Associate Dean for Research Data Management at the Libraries at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. I've been working with Jacob for uh, quite a while now, and I lead the Open Source Programs Office here at Johns Hopkins. Thank you, Saeed. Philippe, might you introduce yourself, please? Sure, my name is Philippe Barre. Uh, I'm a technical project manager working at the city of Paris. Thank you, Philippe. Aster, could you introduce yourself, please? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Aster Nemeling Karlberg, Policy Director with the Think Tank uh, Open Forum Europe in Brussels. And Neja, perhaps you could introduce yourself, please, for the audience. Uh, hello, I'm Neja Lanoir. I'm CIO of City of Paris. Thank you. And my name is Claire Dillon. I work with Jacob in Moss Labs. Uh, and I'm delighted to welcome you all here today. Uh, and I know, I know with, we know that the trends in open source have um, been incredibly positive in the last little while, uh, but we have not heard as much about what the impact has been in municipalities and cities. I know that the city of Paris has had a large amount of experience with open source and has had great success with its project Lutes. Uh, Neja, perhaps you can give us some background information about your experiences with open source and Lutes. Thank you. Uh, the story began in the city of Paris in 2002, uh, when the newly elected Council of Paris uh, decided to promote an open source strategy. And uh, so they voted to share and to make free all of future open source software developed by uh, the city hall. And they believed that um, uh, public money should benefit other municipalities and administrations, and therefore citizens would only pay once for the public code. And uh, since this time, the city of Paris has continuously improved its OS software, and at the same time has been making the source code freely available. And uh, after having developed a very high number of open source information systems since this time, we felt in uh, June uh, 19, uh, uh, 2019, uh, we felt it was time for us to promote even more than before our open source strategy and uh, applications. So in June 2019, we hosted an event with some of the key open source experts in the world, as well as municipalities, administrations, uh, to work together and to discuss what it would take for a free and open source software to be widely distributed and used. Uh, we hoped uh, that this uh, summit would give an additional impetus to the OS community. Now uh, we are in year two after the summit and we are contributing to various workshops in collaboration with the universities and are partnering with other cities to scale tools and uh, to share city services uh, platform. Uh, as you know, one of the outputs of the summit was to develop OSPOs, and uh, maybe Said will talk uh, more about it, but since then GSU and Lero have already set up OSPOs, and City of Paris is working very hard today on the subject. We are very optimistic that this will be ready shortly, uh, in spite, of course, of the difficulties due to the COVID uh, pandemic uh, today. 
Thank you for sharing that, uh, Neja. And it's wonderful to hear about your plans for the Paris Open Source Programme Office. Um, I know that the discussions that you had in the summit in Paris has led to many collaborations uh, from that community that were brought together there. So thank you for that. Philippe, you have been involved in the practical side of implementing LUTES. Perhaps you can share some of your journey um, through that implementation. Um, through many solutions, uh, LUTES serves the city, um, have a bigger impact on citizens. Uh, I will not name all of our 250 dig digital services that are available, of course, for the Parisians, but for instance, participatory budgeting um, is a solution, so is a digital service that was launched in 2014 and that allows citizens um, to submit ideas to improve the urban living environment. 5% um, of the investment budget of the city, which still represents 100 million euros per year, is made available to carry out the elected projects. So this is half a billion euros that this platform can help distribute during a mayor's mandate. Um, this is how in 2018, seven elected projects were citywide, 173 district-wide and 51 for more working class neighborhoods. More, uh, most of the projects uh, concern the clean, cleanliness of the city uh, efforts dealing with climate change uh, by finding ways to produce energy and reduce consumption. Um, then comes public health, uh, all kinds of uh, transportation, sports, you name it. Um, another impactful in example would be Don Maru, uh, which is a mobile application to report incidents in the public space uh, by uploading a photograph uh, and a geolocalized address. Depending on the nature of the incidents, whether it is graffiti or littering, um, the incident is automatically forwarded to the technical services um, within the city, providers and private partners to handle it. So users are given updates in real time. One last example would be our uh, appointment booking plugin, which allows people being received for a growing number of subjects without queuing and register for events, um, and which was recently also, it helped uh, make it possible for surgery masks deliveries. That's fantastic. And I think it's such a wonderful example of how open source can have a direct impact on citizens. And can you perhaps comment, Philippe, about the benefits of why choosing the open source way helped you in your implementation of LUTES? Um, using open source, I'll just run through open doors, but it ensures trust. The very main thing for a municipality like Paris is to ensure trust with its, its uh, citizens. When you set up uh, a participatory budgeting, an appointment booking system, or a tax simulator, you need to make sure that citizens trust you as a city so that they use the service and follow you in the digital way. Um, open code means anyone can deeply look and how, at, at how things are done, um, that there are no bias and that equity is guaranteed. Um, having control on your digital services help us reuse our developments. We're not forced to pay again and again for the same things. And this means that we need to always keep in mind how to build in order to be reused. And this is a very cultural thing here at the city of Paris. So whenever we need to launch a new service, we only focus on what's new and reuse what can be. So this is how the participatory budgeting could be made in only a few months. Um, and this is also how, on October 1st, the city of Budapest launched in its own PB project by hiring a whole team of one developer for the integration and hacks. So in a few months only, they were able to launch it. So this is also possible when working on standards and how fast the upscaling can be. 
That's fantastic. And I know I have heard many of the arguments around how open source can accelerate development, and that's been well established. But that point about trust is so important. It's one that I'm passionate about. We have had our own experience in Ireland recently of launching the Ireland COVID tracker app. Um, and that was built as um, and released initially as an open source project which was done specifically to build trust with the privacy experts and advocates in Ireland. And as a result, we had a, a, a huge take up among the Irish population, which I don't think would have happened without uh, the fact that it had been made available and transparent to those experts to look at. Um, and when we think about all the challenges for digital transformation today for cities um, and that building trust with citizens becomes so important. Um, but you also talked about that collaboration opportunity across across national boundaries. And it's fantastic to hear about your success in, in having Lutes have impact in places like Budapest. But I know it's gone even further than that, geographically speaking. And um, so based on the collaboration that you guys started at that summit in Paris, um, Jacob, perhaps you can describe how Lutes has had an impact in Baltimore. Sure, I'm happy to uh, discuss Baltimore. Baltimore is about to go through a digital transformation. There are a lot of the digital services uh, that the city is looking at, 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 uh, at putting into place. And some of us were asking the question, where is the opportunity for openness and transparency? Where is the open source solutions available for cities like Baltimore to choose from? And um, what that journey led us to the folks here at, at, in, the, in the city of, of Paris, Neja and Phil, we're, we're, uh, we're tr tr uh, we, we got connected to them and we had a tremendous conversation about their project Lutes. And it seemed very fitting that uh, the, both the technology around Lutes, bringing that ball back to Baltimore as a solution, as well as the spirit and the passion uh, of to see a, see a government so committed to bringing open source to its citizens to try to get that culture um, brought back and, and and made available to to both the cities citizens of Baltimore the constituents of Baltimore and the cities in, in general um, that led us to uh, a, a tr tremendous partnership to really say let's look outside of Baltimore itself let's say not not can we do everything on, on our own we are part of a larger ecosystem. And that larger ecosystem is the open source ecosystem that many in this, this community, many of the people in the room who will be viewing this uh, at, the, at the Linux Foundation, that ecosystem that, uh, we've, we've, uh, that you participate in at the Linux uh, conferences, at Eclipse conferences, and at many of the open source uh, community events, that is that spirit of openness and transparency, that concept of community that I think translates very well to the, what we're trying to do uh, and a lot of the stakeholders are, have been trying to do in Baltimore for, for a long time. It was that kind of connection that, uh, uh, that brought us to the, the participation uh, with the help of Denise Cooper uh, to launch the, the summit uh, with, with uh, Neja and the city of Paris in June of, of 2019 to really explore the idea of where is, the, where is there an opportunity for the open source community the open source ecosystem, all of the major players within the open source uh, ecosystem to come together and try to have a collective impact for cities in general. It was, it, it was an amazing event and we've seen a lot of great um, 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 uh, work come out of, of, of that, um, out of that summer, that summit. One of the specific outcomes of that and realizations is that what we're talking about when we're talking about open source is not just the collaboration between individuals around code. It is the collaboration between institutions, the collaboration between institutions of governments and cities, universities, and the private sector itself. As, as a microcosm of the, of the summit where we all got together, what we saw is we needed to find a way for that kind of conversation, for an institutional construct to exist, to allow the, that, that spirit of collaboration to really um, uh, have impact and to see tangible results. The Linux Foundation and the To-Do Group have been, have been great in popularizing this concept called the Open Source Program Office. The Open Source Program Office um, has been this, this construct that allows industry to best interface a corporate organization to the broader open source ecosystem. 
So we theorized, can we then not expand that construct to governments and universities in a more systematic and structured way to allow these collaborations that we saw ha happening at the summit in June 19th in Paris to occur on a much more regular basis. And um, uh, um, it, we've had a lot of great success from that. We've created a, a working group and you'll hear some of the stories very soon of um, some of the other OSPOs um, that, that have been brought together through this. The, some of the collaborations that were already starting to, to occur from this and uh, to see how using an OSPO has made it possible for the collaboration around Lutest, for both Lutest to get worldwide uh, exposure and collaboration, as well as for uh, groups that have OSPOs to contribute back. And, and it's a real concrete example of where the open source ecosystem, I, I believe, can come together through a structured way of collaborating around projects and, 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 and that can have such great impact to the cities of the world. I'll, I'll t t turn it back to you, Claire, but before I do, I wanted to mention the, the, the scale of the challenge we're facing. There are 32,000 municipalities in the US alone. 32,000 opportunities for the benefits that, that the work that Paris has done to be brought over to, to, to benefit them, as well as an opportunity for all of the work of those 32,000 municipalities to uh, transfer back over to Europe and, and elsewhere globally. That's the kind of collaborative uh, ecosystem we're really trying to uh, foster here. I think that's fantastic because what we've, you know, when we hear about the benefits of open source and what it can bring to citizens in terms of trusted citizen services, then really the question is how do we scale that? And what I'm hearing is that the construct of the open source program office in the context of cities and universities can really help build those pathways to allow those co collaborations to happen much more smoothly and more often. And when you talk about that scale of the municipalities from a US perspective, we know that they're, you know, again, taking that then and multiplying it by the number in, from a European perspective and indeed worldwide, you can see so much opportunity emerge from that. And sometimes it's just about helping it along the way. And I know that your work in Baltimore um, has actually been linked from, from a city perspective or a local perspective to a university perspective in the form of Johns Hopkins, who are, who are you know, based in Baltimore. Um, and Saeed, uh, perhaps you can then comment about how you're part of this journey and how Johns Hopkins has been involved in the open source program office movement. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that, Claire. Thank you. Uh, for all the reasons that we've just discussed, uh, we, we felt it was really compelling and important to launch an open source program office out, out of Johns Hopkins. We, we believe it's the first OSPO in a research university in the U.S. Uh, and you, you, for all the points about trust, community, scalability, all of those are, are really critical and essential in terms of why we decided to do this. It is fundamentally a new way of collaborating. Um, so universities in the US uh, certainly, but I think throughout the world have relationships with the municipalities in which they're embedded. Uh, in some cases, the US has these terms called college towns. These are literally municipalities that you know, live and breathe because of the university being close by. The president at Johns Hopkins, for example, has stated that one of the core priorities for our institution is to work closely with Baltimore City. The expression he used was, as Baltimore goes, so goes Johns Hopkins, really conveying that sense of if the city doesn't thrive, then the university will struggle as well and, and vice versa. But what I will say is a lot of the those kinds of collaborations tend to be along a somewhat discrete one-way model, which is where the university says, we have all these resources, expertise, capacity, and we're bringing it to you, the city of Baltimore, in this one-time event, in these series of town halls, in these kinds of, you know, sort of specific interactions. What's been so interesting and appealing about working with Lutes and a local community center here, the St. Francis Neighborhood Center, is we now have a continuous relationship with them. We are working in an open way using this platform with the community center directly and frequently. They, they are on our Slack channel. Uh, so when we are talking about technical issues or uh, language issues, uh, which you know, from our perspective, sorry, we don't speak French. Um, I apologize for that. But all those kinds of things that you really are typically behind the scenes, right? You don't think about this, sharing those kind of information with the people that we use the platform. 
but we think it's important to do so. The OSPO allows us to have an interface from the university to the community centers, to the municipalities, to partners in other countries. Uh, if I had to try and do this kind of work through the legal arrangements that typically a university would, would work on, I, it would not happen nearly as quickly and as seamlessly as it has. So the OSPO has basically allowed us to tap into the capacity and expertise within Johns Hopkins, reach out directly to our partners in Paris uh, that have developed the platform and engage repeatedly, continuously, you know, in a very dynamic and respectful way with the community center that, that will use it. And we believe by doing so, we are basically setting up a model uh, and a, you know, sort of an example that the rest of the city's community centers can look at. And in, in many ways, it's a different form of interacting with the city as well. It's very different if the university and the mayor's office have a conversation versus community centers where people are directly using their services. And many of the services that Nejan truly described are universal, right? And Don Maru is 311 in the United States context. But participatory budgeting doesn't exist uh, in, in Baltimore. But I can assure you as a citizen of Baltimore, that is something we want, uh, particularly now. So while the results will be different, the needs are very similar. Uh, and the approach of using this open source uh, you know, ecosystem that Jacob described has just been wonderful. Uh, I think that's fantastic. And I remember hearing some of the feedback uh, from uh, citizens of Baltimore. And uh, there was one comment that really stuck with me when they were talking about how the benefits of open source, there was a comment about the idea that sometimes when you're um, a, an individual, that sometimes you feel that like, you know, institutions sometimes do tech for you. It's kind of like everything's built for you and you're just expected to accept it. Um, but they made the comment that they felt that your collaboration, something technology was being built with them and that that made a difference in terms of their um, wanting to take that on and, and, and the value that they saw in it. And um, because their participation in that way in your collaboration uh, was, was so valued that it really meant that, it, that, that they felt ownership of that as well. And I think that's something that when we think about citizen services, we would all like to see um, more of. So thank you, Saeed, and congratulations. Um, and Astor, perhaps we can come to you now, because I know that everything we've talked about here, these trends have been emerging over some time, but I believe that there are, um, there are changes afoot, or at least there are new guidelines and things like that coming from the European Union and the European Commission in respect of open source. So perhaps you can comment on the reports you've been involved in. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you very much, Claire. Uh, the, um... Um, you know, as a think tank uh, working a lot on open source and open source policy, uh, I have to say that there's uh, just in the last year or so, things have been moving uh, quite quickly and quite dramatically in terms of the conversation. And, um, and I guess I'll start off a little bit just with, with um, um, the kind of uh, grand and broad perspectives of the EU and the European Commission to bring it back down to the level of the city, uh, uh, the municipality and the citizen, because they're all linked here. And uh, I would say that the, there's been an awakening uh, in the EU and uh, among many of the EU governments, uh, and of course in the European Commission, uh, you know, they've recognized that you know, open source is uh, widespread, not just in the private sector, which you know, that truth we know, but you know, uh, if you look at any public administration today that has any kind of digital ambitions, open source is part of the conversation. It's, that is the reality. Um, at the same time, um, the Commission and the EU is concerned of uh, Europe's place in the world uh, digitally. Uh, where are we in terms of uh, competitiveness and impact? And this is in a world uh, of in unstable geopolitics and, and um, uh, there are trade tensions. There are, are, are uh, identified dependencies in the digital infrastructure. And I would say that these three things have changed the conversation in Brussels uh, and in, in many of the member state capitals, realizing that um, open source is not just a conversation around cost saving. It's not just a conversation um, about like agile, uh, good software development and connection to communities. While all this is very important, open source is also of a, a strategic nature today. The conversation 
uh, and the way open source is looked at, it's uh, it's part of the conversations of the big digital uh, challenges that that uh, Europe faces. And having said that, you know, you see indications of that in many of the strategic documents. I'll touch on some of these, but it's it's really more than just talk. There are actually efforts and things being done. And and uh, the first one, and we're quite excited about this. I think it's on the 28th of October. The European Commission is releasing uh, the fourth iteration of its uh, open source strategy. Um, this, uh, uh, and now this is a little bit of EU talk, but this has been upgraded from an internal strategy of, of, the, uh, of the, the, the Directorate General for Informatics in charge of the IT infrastructure to a commission communication. So this is a document and a strategy that touches every single part of the commission. And a lot of the effort in this strategy is going to, to uh, be to make sure that this is a transformational document that looks to see how the work within the commission can be changed in the broadest sense, like so horizontally in the organization to really change the way of working with digital in the European Commission. So this is a very brave and big step in many ways uh, for the commission, really showing that they are, are uh, pivoting in terms of how they engage with open source. And then Together with that, there's also something that we are very, very involved in at, at uh, Open Forum Europe. Um, um, uh, the commission in, in uh, January this year uh, commissioned um, uh, an impact study of uh, uh, open source on you know, uh, the economy, uh, um, but also digital independence and competitiveness. And this uh, is expected to um, uh, be released in I think January, and just to put this a little bit, you know, uh, into context, it's a big report. I think it's probably going to uh, touch on four or five hundred pages uh, of of uh, deep analysis of different case studies, countries, uh, economic impact models. You name it. It really takes the broad picture of open source in Europe, um, and this hasn't been done since um, I think two thousand six. And anyone who's been involved in the open source space would probably agree that things have changed quite drastically from 2006 till today. Uh, so we're quite, uh, quite excited about this one. And um, you know, just to give some hints, on the 5th of November, we're gonna present some of the preliminary uh, um, findings, but um, there are significant effects that we've identified already on, on you know, the pro anything from productivity benefits on companies that contribute upstream um, to, to labor productivity. Um, and just the, 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 you know, open source contributions as a driver for startup formation. So that it, all these efforts by, by uh, the cities and the universities have a direct link also to the economy. And in that sense also, uh, um, this has really awakened the European Commission's interest in the question. Um, then uh, um, I, there are so many different things, but just big efforts also happening in Germany and a lot of focus on this in their conversations around how they're gonna uh, digit transform, digitally transform the country. Um, uh, this also all plays into uh, um, the COVID situation and the recovery funds. Uh, the, you know, the, the new presentation uh, or the way the Europe sees it is we're entering now, or the European Commission sees it, is we're entering the, the, the European digital decade. And 20%, uh, this is something like 150 billion euros of the recovery fund that has been um, uh, go, going to be invested and alleviated, 20% of this is going to go into digital transformation. There are deep questions about what do we invest in? How do we invest for something that moves Europe forward, that does, you know, maintains independence, maintains sovereignty, and open source is part of uh, every single one of these conversations. And this is starting uh, to really dawn on key policymakers in Europe. So um, and then to just bring this then to the conversation of the Austrian government, because uh, as this infrastructure of delivering some of the, the key things that any kind of open source related policy uh, coming out of Brussels, this is extremely important. There needs to be an infrastructure, there needs to be a network, there needs to be organizational constructs that can absorb these priorities, exchange, give feedback on, uh, make sure that there's not just a report coming out of uh, the commission, but it's actually something that captures all of Europe, reaches the citizens. Uh, uh, and, and here, uh, what Jacob said is so key uh, in my view. Um, it's um, having a quote unquote standardized uh, uh, organizational construct that can speak the same language, have similar mandates, that it can uh, talk to each other in a way that uh, Paris and Baltimore does, 
um, that they really understand each other. That is key to, to uh, any kind of policy rollout when it comes to, to strengthening uh, uh, and uh, driving Europe's digital transformation uh, you know, on, on a regional level, on, on a country level, because the truth is, and this is also a realization of anyone who's uh, a, a player in Brussels, uh, no city, no company, uh, no country, and not even, I would say, that Europe itself uh, can do this alone. There needs to be these networks of collaboration. There needs to be sharing. And I think that, you know, coming down to, to all of these key priorities of the Commission and its systems and how they work for uh, encouraging sharing and reuse of software code across Europe, to encourage cross-border um, uh, digital services and government, all this you know, open source and open standards, it will be key to, to all of these conversations in order to, um, and as well as OSPOs and these organizational co constructs to create this kind of cross-border interoperability because the question comes down to scale. The questions ahead and the challenges are massive. And if the conversations are not about how to also bring this to scale, um, then they're almost not worth having. And right there in the middle, I see uh, the OSPO playing a massive part uh, 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 for how, how the public, uh, public sector can engage in this. Um, and also then interface, as Jacob said, with uh, research, uh, research universities, uh, with companies. And you know, all of this comes into, for a city in a region um, that is very focused on the day-to-day -day challenges of its citizen, to also be able to, through this network, start thinking and talking about that effort that is done towards the citizen, uh, citizens or the, the, uh, in the city or in the region, um, saving costs only using one, that's great. But in doing this work, in this network, we can also start talking about building things at massive European and to be honest, global scale. And that is how all this, I think, fits together. And we can actually, you know, this is the practical effort of actually walking the walk uh, uh, of, finding ways of using open source to solve Europe's digital challenges. Thank you, Aster. And I, and I think it's so important. Um, I mean, you talk about the idea that no one, no one, anything can do it alone. But, uh, but even when then you take the speed at which we now need to respond, which I think, again, things like COVID has really brought that into sharp relief that, you know, regardless of, even if you think you can do it alone, you'll never do it fast enough um, to, to, to be able to respond to today's global challenges. So, so the, the idea that that, that that interface can help speed that innovation, yeah. um, I think it becomes incredibly important. So thank you very much. And Neja, you, you've heard now, we've heard from Aster about the, the plans for Europe and uh, the, the policy changes and um, that are going to be coming out in the next while. Could you maybe comment on Paris's policy moving forward with respect to open source? Uh, so, uh, from a policy perspective, and as uh, uh, we have uh, just said, you probably know that there are several key factors which are very important uh, for all the open source community, but for the uh, city of Paris uh, also. The first one, and uh, Philip spoke about it, is trust. Uh, open source uh, established trust and transparency between uh, citizens and public services. Uh, then there is the principle of um, when we use public money, we should therefore, as far as possible, provide public code. Uh, and the citizen must pay just once for public developments. We also believe that uh, sharing and collaborating between cities and administrations and companies, private companies, bring more progress. Uh, we use saving money and uh, so on. And uh, working together enables richer, smarter, flexible software developments uh, adapted to the common needs of the local authorities and uh, the common concerns of the citizens. There is no point in reinventing the, the wheel, technically or from the business point of view. Uh, so uh, we all have the same concerns and needs in, uh, for example, the local authorities, and we can share very easily our software if we have the will to do it. Uh, so in conclusion, cities have their own means to regain control over their digital services 
including cost, privacy control. They must work together in the right direction for digital sovereignty and independence. And uh, that's why what we are going to launch again for the current mandate, which is just uh, beginning. And as you know, we have a new, uh, a new team now after the, the elections. And uh, our future digital roadmaps is going to, uh, to continue all the work we have uh, already done. Uh, because uh, uh, Philip has spoken about uh, LUTES, but uh, uh, we have also other uh, open source systems developed and uh, which are very, very useful during the crisis. Uh, like, for example, um, the botany plant management system. Uh, called Botalista and uh, which was developed with the city of Geneva and uh, which is now adopted by other international cities. We have also uh, developed a digital work platform for teaching with other lo local authorities uh, and it's now used by thousands of schools, primary, middle and high schools. And this was extremely useful during the COVID lockdown in France uh, enabling schools to continue their classes remotely, keeping students in contact with their, with their schools. And we, we, we must not forget the infrastructure point of view, uh, because we are also involved in open source. Uh, for example, our default navigator is Firefox, and we enable our employees to use uh, open source office tools such as LibreOffice, uh, even if it's not uh, mandatory for them, because it's difficult, as you know. Uh, for our technical foundation, we give always priority to open source tools like uh, Linux, Tomcat, Postgres, Ansible, Kibana for our uh, Elasticsearch, for our um, data platform, which is also developed on open source. So we spoke about the digital services for the citizens, but the infrastructure domain is also very, very, very important. So, of course, our most investment in Paris was the LUTES platform, but um, we have to, to be more general and develop uh, and also think about all the other aspects. Thank you. Thank you, Neja. And it sounds really exciting. And I'm sure we're all looking forward to hearing more about the other open source uh, projects that you have in Paris, considering the great success in terms of the collaboration around your test. So thank you for that. Saeed, you also heard um, Aster's uh, commentary about what's happening in the EU. And of course, uh, Neja mentioned elections. We know that elections are coming up in the US as well. But, but when we think about um, from a policy perspective at a global level, or from a US perspective, how, how do you see open source and Johns Hopkins role in terms of thinking about how open source can actually help from an economic perspective? Uh, I think it's a really important point raised in terms of open source as a driver for broader you know, e economic development, workforce development and, and, and so on. And I think that uh, the United States, unfortunately, from my perspective, doesn't have uh, some of the national kinds of frameworks or certainly global frameworks that you've you heard about from Neja and from Aster. But the reality is that we do have organizations such as the National Academies uh, of Sciences and Engineering and Medicine. Uh, we have the funders, uh, the federal funders that get together through interagency working groups and so on. And there's active discussion in these forums about the importance of software. Um, so there's been a lot of movement in the open science and open scholarship arena around articles and data. Uh, but much more recently, there's a significant uh, deal of attention and, and energy around software. So we are looking at the work we're doing at Hopkins, and that's starting to happen in other universities as well, uh, as possibly seeding those conversations, uh, keeping a very you know, firm eye toward what's happening in Europe, and, and basically making the argument, a lot of the arguments that we've heard today, of course, apply very much in the US. Uh, and I think that's true independent of what the results of the election might be, right? We, we still have to think about COVID response. We still have to think about creating jobs. We still have to think about collaboration uh, solutions at scale. So we're hoping uh, in, in the US, we do a lot of things bottom up. Basically the universities form a, an informal network in many ways influence the work of the funders, influence the work of the policy groups. Uh, and we're hoping that some of the things we're doing at Hopkins and starting to do with other universities can provide a lot of that 
uh, you know, feedback and a lot of that expert advice that can craft some sort of uh, policy response as well. Thank you. And, and I also want to say thank you from Ireland's perspective. I know, um, as Neja mentioned, um, Lero, the Irish Software Research Centre, is has recently launched their own open source program office. And I know they are looking forward to working with Johns Hopkins on various different collaborations and programs. So um, it's marvellous to see all these connections happening um, back and forth across the Atlantic. Uh, Philippe, perhaps I can come to you now and just say, you know, when you think about the future and you think about how from an implementation perspective, you're moving the, these policy um, things forward. Um, what, what do you see in the future for um, your role in, in open source? Well, as I said, uh, we have to, to remember that we strongly believe at the City of Paris that most of our needs are shared by any other city. So ever since this project was open sourced, we've made efforts to grow the community to reach bigger impact on citizens. By opening our code to other cities, we secretly hope that they will contribute back so we can improve our digital tool tools thanks to them and also unlock even more value also for others to benefit from. So one of the outputs of the last year's uh, Open Source City Forum is that we are now working with the Johns Hopkins University, um, and which is a great thing, uh, and as Neja and uh, Said previously said, we're tech guys talking to each other and making this evolve and very quickly because we speak the same language. So they're contributing, bringing expertise on the internationalization of the solution since we've had never faced it before. So we hope this will also help in a broader adoption by cities across the, the borders. In the near future, we, we try to gather collective intelligence, work with ethics, and for the good of all. Um, we're in a context, as I've said many times, with low and decreasing budget, where more needs to be made with less. So more administrations or government can come along bring their expertise and instead of having 10 different solutions do the same things and found it as many times, we can be maybe more 10, 10 groups working on the best solution for all of us, make services more complete, quicker to reuse and also implement. This is what to expect from open source. And once again, benefits from what's already has been paid for by public service for public services. So we at the city of Paris do not intend to do open source just by throwing some code on GitHub and call it open source. We must make the difference between noun open source and the verb open source. That's why we're here actively trying to grow our users and developers uh, community so it is sustainable and scalable now. Having examples of new cities, great, but we would need at least a few more to really benefit from the community. Thank you, and, and I look forward to seeing more people get engaged, and I know that your approach and the impact that you're having on citizens should certainly inspire them to also become engaged, so thank you very much. Jacob, we'll come to you now. Um, you know, you, you were inspired by this initial collaboration to to think about the idea of encouraging this, you know, the setup of more open source program offices. Um, can you talk to me about, the, about how that movement's going and if people are interested in getting involved, how they might do that? Sure. Uh, let's start with, I wanted to start with the, the, the name of Lutes. Lutes is the, uh, from my understanding from oh, uh, the last couple of years working with Neja and Phil, Lutes is named for the, uh, the, the, the town and the area on which Paris eventually grew out of. It was the, the precursor name of, of the city of Paris before the city of Paris was the city of Paris. And I think that's very fitting when we talk about where this effort is going. Um, from that town of Lutes sprung this amazing city that we, is known the world over 
called Paris, a city that is known for collaborations on many fronts, in including climate change. And I look to say, can we not have a similar evolution for the collaborations that are occurring from the faces of, of this uh, group right here, uh, this, these nascent uh, collaborations that we've set up, these nascent ideas about OSPO. I, I really look forward to the challenge that the, um, the summit in 2019 in Paris set before us. Where does open source go? What does open source look like in five years? What is that interface? How do we have impact within five years? How do we have open source um, benefiting cities uh, at scale within five years? Hopefully it doesn't take as long as it took to, for the, the, the town of Lutes to become the city of Paris as it will for us to achieve that goal. And I think we're uh, well on our way. From, from very, some very practical think, uh, things um, to get this going, we've uh, at Moss Labs have convened a working group we intend this working group to be a global uh, working group uh, to allow uh, that, that collaboration to build OSPOs. So we invite cities, universities, and research centers to come participate in this working group as, as, a, as the concrete way for us to get our work done and for us to grow this, this community collaboration of, of institution to institution collaboration to really have some of the, the, the impact that um, Aster and Saeed and Neja and others have, have, have said you know, that, that, that have painted the picture of where we can possibly go with some of the greatest challenges that um, we face as, as, a, as a global society. Thank you. And if anyone wants to get involved in this working group, who should they email or how should they contact you? Sure. Well, the working group meets uh, every two weeks and uh, the, the initial on rep to that working group is to send us an email at Moss Labs. You can, the easiest way to do that is info at mosslabs.io. Excellent. Well, um, I think that that's been a marvelous tour of, of the, the journey that you all have taken for the last um, year and a bit. And I just want to say congratulations to everyone because it's been the impact that that collaboration has actually resulted in has been huge by all accounts on in, in, in everywhere where it's touched. So thank you all for, for that. And thank you for participating in this panel to share your story. Um, I hope that everyone listening um, can gain inspiration from this about the power that something like uh, an open source program office at a municipal level or in universities, the impact that that can have. Um, and I do hope you'll join us on the next part of this journey. So thank you all. Thank you, Neja. Thank you, Philippe. Thank you, Saeed. Thank you, Aster. And thank you, Jacob. Um, and I hope that we will all um, see each other in person again soon. Thank you all. Bye-bye.